Hi everyone, my name is Kibra Zengin and I am the North America Regional Lead for Google Developer Groups and Women Tech Makers programs at Google. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the Between the Brackets. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat, so we would love to know where you are joining from. While you are doing that one, I would like to kick it off with an introduction to the Between the Brackets. Between is a monthly web series where we host experts and Googlers to talk about niche and fun topics on Google products and technologies. You can check out the website for more information on the schedule and topics spe specifically. We will cover web, Flutter, Android, Firebase, Cloud and AI ML themes this year. So we are very thrilled to have you join us today and then we hope you all enjoy the show. But before that, housekeeping. So as this is a great guideline for all of our events, I would like to remind you all of you to be excellent to each other. To that extent, please follow all the community guidelines on our website and then all the links that we share. So you can see on the screen. Um, secondly, add your questions to the chat and then our um, host will be answering those questions uh, in a timely manner. And lastly, we are here to help you with your questions as well. So if you have any concerns or comments about the program in general, please sh share with us at btb-team at google.com. So now let's get it started. Today's episode will host two amazing experts on their field to talk about PWA, Progressive Web Apps, and then uh, you can ask your questions during the show directly, again, in the comment section of YouTube, and we will address them uh, one by one. And now I would like to welcome uh, Alex and then Adriana, who are, again, uh, PDEs and then uh, Googlers just joining us today. So welcome. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I will just leave the floor to you, uh, and then you can just, you know, introduce yourselves and then just start the show. <laughs> Thank you for having us, Kubra. Uh, Adriana, do you want to go ahead? Um, well, uh, I am a developer relations engineer at Google right now. Uh, I was a software developer uh, at Google for six years and the um, um, last project that I did uh, as an engineer was a PWA. It was for capturing uh, media and uh, having it published in story form on the web. And uh, after that, like I decided like this is a very cool technology and I want to help developers uh, use it more and use it better. And that's when I switched to be a developer religious engineer, focus on uh, Chrome, the web, and um, progressive web apps. Awesome. Well, thank you, Adriana. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with you today to talk about progressive web apps and hardware APIs for the web. My name is Alex Castillo. Uh, I'm a co-founder at Neurosity, and I have a, a big passion for the web and for hardware. This is why I think this topic uh, is, is perfect. And uh, So yeah, today uh, we're going to be uh, going through two uh, big things, which are progressive web apps and then hardware APIs for web. Um, I'm very lucky to be with Adriana here, and we're just going to go ahead and kick it off and start uh, the conversation. So why don't we just uh, go ahead? Um, yeah, so I guess I, I, I can start uh, talking a little bit like what are progressive web apps and... Um, it's funny because if you Google what are progressive web apps, you get a bunch of different answers. And yeah. um, I think like everyone in the community uh, struggles to define it, uh, but it, because it is more of like an umbrella term, it is not like a framework or it is not uh, like a product in a specific, um, but it's more of like a pattern um, to make the switch of the web being seen as more for consuming content 
and like foreseeing documents and uh, shifting it to be the users interacting with the uh, web. And um, I think back then for interactive experiences, the concept that we had was apps. Uh, and that's why it felt like we were making the web more like an app. And that's why we uh, gave it the, and I say we, I wasn't there, but <laughs> that's why people gave it the name of uh, progressive web apps as the um, web was gaining these capabilities that were reserved traditionally for apps that were specific to the platforms. So for example, the access to these devices that you're gonna be showing us and all these hardware APIs, being able to interact with uh, Bluetooth, with NFC, uh, these was, were things that were not implemented uh, on the web. Um, the ability to, I, I, I know um, browsers have had an issue implementing this functionality, but uh, apps, on the web before they couldn't send notifications. Um, they couldn't even be installed or searched on your devices. And so the paradigm shift of enabling the web to do all these advanced functionalities is what we call a progressive web app. Yeah, and what I love is that if you go back and you start seeing the progression of the web and with everything going on and the Web3 movement right now, people have been trying to start to remind people where we started with like Web1 and how we changed to Web2 uh, and the evolution of the web. But this part of the web, right, um, where, like you said, um, web pages that traditional were created to serve content now can give you so much access to the device that it runs in. And not only that, it can run so many different type of devices that are not necessarily the traditional computer that you have. So I think progressive web app have come uh, at an amazing time um, and have added so much more to the experience of the web and, and the gap keeps getting rich more and more and more. Um, so I, I appreciate your definition. Um, and calling it an umbrella term because it's, it is that, it is so much to cover. Um, so you mentioned already some of the like capabilities in API. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit more um, on, on the benefits of like being able to, to install an application, right? Uh, we change the dynamic um, in the way you interact with the web because now you, can install a web application, you get it as an icon and you don't have to type that URL, you, have, you get easier access, but that's just the start of it, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, I think, um, I, again, in the beginning, like we were like, we have to make the web installable. We have to make the web installable. And we were focused like telling people like, now you can install the web, now you can install the web. But now we are at a point that we are like, okay, but so what? <laughs> um, but I think like um, that's what we're trying to do now, like tell the people that this is a big, big, big opportunity because the web has a huge reach uh, because it is present in every platform. So you are not restricted by a specific platform, by a specific technology, uh, but it's basically the means that you have to interact with the web. And we have several browser vendors. So it is, it is very flexible and you can choose however you want to interact with the web. And um, for users, like they have the same experience that they have with your site in every platform. So there is no confusion of like, oh, how do I do this on my phone versus how do I do this on my computer? Um, or it, as you say, like it enables experiences for the web on other devices like um, virtual reality, like the Oculus, uh, Oculus um, thing. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> like, the Oculus headsets, yes. yes. They, they are actually like a lot of the apps that they have for virtual reality are uh, developed on the web. And like, it's just, I feel that it's still the flow of 
many users that they go and they search, search for something on the web. Uh, and for example, like they are buying something and um, they go and search and like read comparisons, read reviews, and then they should choose what to buy. And they are already on like the vendor side, they make the purchase. And then at the end, they are uh, presented with this, like go to a store to install our app, to track your purchase. And it's like, and I am like, but I'm already on the website. Like if I could keep it, just keep the website on right. my phone to track my thing, I would do it. But I am not gonna do the effort to go to the app store and install the whole thing. <laughs> It, it takes kind of like a, a different level of commitment uh, yeah. when you're going to then switch. It's just like you're switching that context. Yeah, you could be interacting with the same brand, uh, but at the end of the day, you have to go through processes that might require for you to even enter a password that you don't remember, right? Uh, and of course, there are many benefits, you know, on with native technologies, you know, that will never be denied. Um, but the, the ease of user experience is definitely something that it, it is a big plus when it comes to web. Yeah, and I think like for developers, it is also a big plus that you have a single code base. And with that single code base, you can reach a bunch of users in all different platforms because uh, we are used of talking about the big companies um, in tech, but the reality is like there are a bunch of um startups and just in, entrepreneurs in general that don't have the resources to have a team dedicated to android a team dedicated to ios a team dedicated to desktop a, a, a team dedicated to the web so if you have an idea you want to try the idea you have one code base and you can present it to users and you can iterate from there so i think in that sense the web is very friendly for developers and it allows you to put your ideas out there like now uh, we have like the perfect use case with Wordle. Like it didn't even have a fancy domain. It didn't have mm -hmm. any apps. Um, you didn't have an account, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. the creator made more, more than a million dollars just with this right. idea that everyone loved. And uh, yeah, yeah with, with like little investment, he put it out to the world and everybody was sharing it. Like, I wonder if you had to install an app, how many less people would do it? Because it is a barrier. Right. It is, it is. And um, I think the the thing to remember is um, it has been a, a curve of like capabilities and we have all of these different APIs and capabilities that keep being added, even today, right? And there are some that might be out already for five years or more, which in terms of web, it is an eternity that many people don't know about yet, right? So there's this whole thing of adoption too, but I would love um, if you can mention some of the, the capabilities that have been part of the umbrella of progressive web apps, right? We mentioned, um, we mentioned the sellability, their offline capabilities, um, their new permission-based API. So uh, why don't we just break it down a bit and start adding some color to to uh, what progressive apps are capable of doing today? Um, so on top of um, installability and as you say, like offline access and notifications that we already mentioned, um, a lot of like, for example, the offline access is done through a um, an API that is called like service workers. So this piece of your progressive web app um, that it, it acts like a proxy between your app and the network. So when the user makes a request to your app, the service worker inspects the request and decides what to do with that request, where to get the response from. And that has enabled uh, a lot of performance gains too, because uh, it, it allows you to manage your cache and where you save your da data and um, how to basically serve your users a faster experience. Or do you want to um, optimize for freshness, in which case like you go to the network and get the, the information that you want, or do you want to optimize for uh, fast retrieval 
and um, then you get things from your cache. Uh, and this allows uh, uh, web apps to uh, be really responsive and uh, be really fast to load because you can cache basically all the essentials at the beginning of your app or at installation. Um, this is also the service workers allows you to do background syncs and background fetches to keep uh, all the experience of your user sync and basically you can have like multi-device journeys where you can start a task on your phone and then when you get to your computer everything is uh, updated there and everything is in sync like you have the same data uh, in your devices and whatever you have at hand you can accomplish your your, your tasks there as a user uh, there are also APIs, for example, if you install a progressive web app, uh, the shortcuts API, it works. So for uh, quick uh, actions that you want to give your users, they work on Android, uh, Windows, and uh, Chrome OS. That's uh, one that I love because um, like there are apps that if you want to create a task, it is right there in the shortcuts. And I think like it gives value and it in incentivizes the user to install your yes. app. Um, yeah. Other things that you can do with progressive web apps. One that we have been working to, one API that we have been working to make um, like really solid and give like a really good experience and also make it very safe is uh, the file handling APIs. So traditionally with web apps, we had to, upload the file, make any changes you, we wanted to make, and then you downloaded the file. And yes. if you needed to change it again, the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. But with five ha handling API, if the user gives the permission, the web app has access to your file system directly. So you can open a code editor. Uh, VS Code actually has this functionality. And mm -hmm. you just edit the file save it and it's the same as with any platform app and so you don't I, need a server like you said to uh you know serve as that uh bridge so you could you know uh upload it download it you do everything locally and also um the important thing to note is that uh historically there wasn't much storage access that you had available on the web right so uh, those capabilities have been increasing in the amount of space too, because when it comes to installability, that's an important factor for like how much can you sell in the, in the actual uh, device, whether it's a computer, whether it's a mobile phone. Yeah, and, and that's another advantage that uh, PWAs have. Like if you have uh, PWAs installed on your phone and like they can be 200K, 300K, and like the smallest uh, platform specific app, at least for Android, is at least for for uh, megas. So that, that 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 that's a big advantage in markets where storage is restricted. Like when we are in the US, we are a little bit privileged and assume that all people have that same space on their devices. But some people really play Tetris with their uh, phone space. And the PWAs yes. on top of like now having access to the file system, so they don't take extra space in that sense. Uh, there are uh, web APIs to so that you as a developer can keep track of how much core that you have, how much you have used, and uh, guide the user to um, clear storage or free storage if they need to. Um, so we have that on PWAs yeah. too. And yeah, there which is, a, there's a huge list of APIs that I, I can yeah. take a long time, but <laughs> let's wait for yeah. questions. <laughs> I think uh, a good mention here, since we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, storage space and like basically resource constraints is, uh, is are the APIs that allow you uh, to be able to serve different content based on like even like network connectivity, right? So that's something that, uh, you know, to your point about not only on the storage side of things that, that might be limited, also connectivity, right? Many parts of the world, the, the internet connection can be, you know, uh, extremely slow, um, which is something that is, is great. 
Um, I think it's also great to mention like how amazing tooling can be for developers to be to even test those things with with Chrome developer tools. I thought it would be just a, a, a nice addition there, just to say. Yeah, the, the, um, this, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, please go ahead. That was it. <laughs> yeah, to, to, totally. Like, I'm biased, of course. I work on the Chrome team. Um, but, um, like, you have, like, a whole application tab on the... Um, on the developer tools. Developer tools, yes. And um, there you can see your service worker that is part of your app. There you can see the storage you're using. There you can see... Um, the cache that you're using and all those like functionalities. Um, and like you can test in different browsers too. Like I, I, I really like the web. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's something that is hard not to fall in love with. Absolutely. So yeah, we, we mentioned um, about scalability. Uh, we mentioned service workers. We mentioned uh, shortcuts, uh, share, uh, file systems, um, hardware connectivity. Of course, there's so much more, like you said. Uh, so in an effort to start um, going a little deeper into some of the things, um, I would like to for us to talk about uh, a couple of examples in PWAs uh, and then maybe start talking about more uh, on the APIs that are on the hardware side. I know that there are some brands that have really adopted P uh, PWAs. I believe Starbucks has a really amazing um, progressive web app. Um, and I feel that there's more and more adoption when it comes to progressive web app because of the benefits, right? Because of the, you know, uh, the cross-platform compatibility aspect of it. Do you have, and, and you did mention about the, the Oculus apps, do you have um, other progressive web app examples that you really like uh, that you think uh, would be worth mentioning? Um yeah and and like this is this is uh totally me and <laughs> what i use day to day but like there are a bunch of uh, companies that have done uh progressive web apps especially because uh it is very easy to publish them to the uh windows store so progressive web apps have replaced a lot of uh windows uh platform specific apps uh so we have brands like instagram facebook <laughs> Um, the Twitter PWA, it's it's really, really good. They have really invested yeah. a lot on uh, their web experience. Um, I they, They're like, Microsoft has like their whole uh, workspace suite, like their whole Outlook, uh, all those uh, apps are uh, have been transformed in PWA, the web version of those. Um, Google Maps, it's a PWA. Um, there are many, yeah. many. Um, SoundCloud, it's a PWA. Uh, Spotify has a PWA. Uh, yes. YouTube. And a very good one, yeah. Yeah, YouTube Music. Um, and like I have um, uh, Todoist, they have, they, they are a, a tool to manage your tasks. So to do task lists and to do mm -hmm. in general uh and i really like that one because that one makes use of this functionality of having like background sync and like you can create a an app in your phone and it is synced to the uh other devices and if you lose connectivity it is gonna try again when you get uh connectivity and I just really like this idea of like, I don't have to learn different UIs, but you know, the add task button is the same everywhere I use the app and I can have it oh, in yes. all my devices. So I really, really like that. And um, this is <laughs> like, this is like a big, big website and it is a, a PWA um, and it's called Board Game Marina and it's made for uh, playing board games online. And I love that one because, like, when the notifications work, um, uh, when you configure them, like, you get notifications on when is your time to go play. And I think that's a brilliant use of notifications. I have it installed on my Mac, on my uh, Chromebook, mm -hmm. on my iPad, <laughs> and on my phone. And wow. um, it lets you... Different. Let's just acknowledge that those are, like, different, very different operating systems. Yeah, 
and like yeah. wh wh wherever I'm playing, like it, I I get the same experience. And um, oh, I, another thing I like, like when I want to start a game, is just sharing a link, and that's it. And um, the last thing is like on on my phone, it is um, like 250k, and I can mm -hmm. play like, thousands of games. Um, so I, I think that that's awesome. I think unlocking those experiences for me, it's priceless. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, the, the board game example, uh, to, to play like that is, is the perfect use case for, for, you know, like PWAs. Um, all right. So since we have you here, you know, uh, and you are part of the Google team that is pushing PWAs forward, uh, any chance you can share some of the new things that are coming out for PWAs? Um, yeah. So we um, are listening to people and figuring out like what they need, what are those use cases that uh, PWAs uh, really unlock for developers and for users. We mm -hmm. uh, want to uh, definitely improve the experience on notifications and yes. on permissions in general. So that's uh, coming for Chrome to make it e easier for users. And we also want to- I'm so excited about that one. Yes. <laughs> um, we are also working on this concept of installability. And we are hoping to make it easier for uh, developers to um, make their websites installable and help more users um, adopt their apps from the web. Uh, we have been working for a while on having um, an enhanced install experience. Um, mm -hmm. And like we have it on uh, mobile. And uh, it's done through some manifest fields and things like that. Uh, we want more and more devs to adopt that. So to like guide users and make the PWAs experiences better. Um, that is awesome. That's a lot of new things. Thank you. Uh, uh, we do have a question here from Renee uh, about push notifications. Uh, is this something that PWA devs uh, utilize often? Uh, I vaguely remember push notifications being difficult on web. Uh, a lot of history in push notifications. Um, would you like to answer that one? Yeah. Uh, it is a, a feature that a lot of um, devs ask for, and they do use it when uh, the, the um, they have, like, the right use case. Um, I think we had, like, a historic problem with the way that permissions and handle and that's what I was talking about like making it easier for an user to enable or disable notifications on a single site and having like not having to go through this pop-up that you don't even see these days because you're like why would I want to get notified um, and then it is really hard re-enabling the notifications if you realize you actually wanted the notifications. Um, yeah. So yeah, right right now we want to make it easier for devs to um, like have the power of like letting people know why they are asking for the notifications in first in the first place. So we are educating the the uh, developers to help their users before they mm -hmm. do the pop up. We are improving the pop-up. We are uh, putting them like on a single place so that it's easier for users to use them. Um, and, you know, the more we also will show later, like how developers can provide feedback to the different browser vendors. Um, and we are listening. So the more like developers say like, hey, we really want to use this. Hey, we really want to use this. The more like the teams uh, optimize this. And like, I don't want to uh, speculate, but uh, it makes me really hopeful that in the last developer preview of Safari, it seemed that they are trying to experiment with a way to allow websites to have uh, push notifications, that that was yes. one of the blockers that uh, we have historically have, that it works on desktops, it works on Androids, uh, but 
it hadn't worked on Safari and on uh, iOS devices. But fingers crossed. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that's the thing about how we evolve the web is that uh, for the web to grow, developers have to voice it, right? And we have to listen to also like uh, the feedback uh, from 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 users and. For an, an API, such as like notifications, push notifications for web, um, it really takes for all vendors to align and that takes an incredible amount of effort. So when that happens and, you know, it gets to that point uh, where it is uh, supported across the board, that's when it really takes off and developers actually feel comfortable using it because they know it's going to be the same. So um, that is great. Uh, news that you share. All right, so I think this is a good time to start um, going into the, the hardware aspect of it. Um, on You know, the same way Progressive Web Apps have enabled so many different things. Do, do you want to answer that question oh. before we go into? <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, RK is asking, what is the best way uh, to optimize uh, Progressive Web App? So optimize can mean, you know, different things in this context. I think, uh, what I want to share when it comes to progressive web apps is um, how you start testing, you know, like installability, how you start testing like uh, this, this, the storage uh, and many of the things that comprises uh, progressive uh, web apps. Um, Adriana, do you have like, um, like, your, like tools that you would recommend uh, for, for this to happen? I know DevTools have m many of the things are, are required. I just don't know if there are any externals that I might be missing. Uh, so we have to remember here that a progressive web app is uh, at its core a website, a website. So any tools that you use to optimize a progressive web app, it, a, a website is going to be used to optimize um, a progressive web app. So any any of the tools that we have for core web vitals and uh, on web.dev slash vitals, we have a bunch of their a, a bunch of advice and tools for performance. You can use uh, Lighthouse to give you tips mm -hmm. too. So in general, anything that makes the experience uh, better in a website is gonna optimize for your PWA. The use of caches, yeah. the use of lazy loading, all those tips also work for a PWA. The only thing that I will add is that PWAs still tend to be new to users. So they don't know the flow of installation. They don't know the enabling notifications. So if you as a developer can add little hints here and there, and we have APIs for like how to handle installation or how to uh, capture the event to ask for notifications. All these things are on web.dev. Um, that's what I would recommend as an optimization, like giving tips yeah. and uh, little tool tips for users on how to use and make the most of your PWA. Onboarding uh, user experiences. Yeah, uh, guide the user to the experience, make sure they feel comfortable and uh, minimize the room for confusion. Yeah, um, a super important part. All right, so we took some questions. Uh, I'd like to now dive into more on the hardware side of the API. So uh, for today, I wanted to focus on um, web NFC and web Bluetooth. Um, and I'll start with uh, web NFC. So web NFC stands for uh, near field communication, right? Um, and now uh, mobile devices, uh, they all come with uh, a chips uh, that uh, allows uh, it to read very thin uh, and very small uh, tags or NFC tags. And I think it, it might be worth this to start showing like what this looks like, right? So I'm gonna, I'm sharing my screen here. I'm bringing this down here. This is an example of an NFC tag. Uh, you can buy NFC tags. They, they are very inexpensive as you can see. Um, and the important thing to note here is that uh, their size um, and their thickness, they can be like sometimes like uh, less than like two millimeters thick. Uh, so they're like flexible, right? Uh, and you are able to basically embed them uh, in a lot of different um, hardware devices. I, I, I happen to have a device here that is, is what my company builds. Um, this, is, this is a crown, this is a, a brain computer interface um, that happens to have uh, an NFC tag embedded. So 
when it comes to to use cases to start adding some color to the problem space that we're dealing here, uh, here is okay if you have a, a device right and you have access to the web how can you start like ident even like identifying and discovering uh, these devices right uh, when it comes to IoT and the Internet of Things um, because of the protocols that we've been working you know um, for the for the web stacks right uh, HTTP and IP um, a, a really good way to identify a device is by having an NFC tag. Um, this has one right here um, at the back of the device. And uh, this one happens to be like super tiny, probably like uh, nine to 15 uh, millimeters. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead, jump into a, a demo. Uh, so we know what this means. So we have a physical device here. Um, I also have uh, an Android device because uh, part uh, of of the web now being able to run in mobile devices is that, um, of course, it's portable and you can do it and you get access to the same APIs. In this example, I'm going to be demoing web APIs for hardware that run mostly in Chrome. Um, and in this example, I just basically will use a, a web browser that's serving a page. Right now, it's just like on my local network. And I'll use the NFC reader that is embedded on this phone, usually at the top of the phone, um, to scan this device. Keep in mind, if you use Apple Pay, uh, I believe that's the same technology that's underlying is uh, near field communication, right? So I have here uh, in this UI um, two buttons. The one that we're going to start with is NFC. So I'll go ahead and tap scan NFC and it shows that it started. So now that it started, uh, I'll go ahead, I'll take this uh, device here and just remember the goal is for me to be able to get like uh, any, a unique identifier for this device so it can be used for other purposes. So I'll take the, the back of the device here. I'll put the, the, the mobile phone near the sensor and it already found, as it says, one record, which is type text, and it found like the device ID. Keep in mind, this is all from a website, right? This is all from a page. Um, for a page to have access to such, to like the old, the way to the stack of the phone down to like the chip that reads this and be able to parse that out is a big feat. And I think it's a big win for the web. So I think it's important to know that um, these hardware APIs, they all require permissions, right? And there are certain things that are needed to make it secure so we can continue to release APIs uh, without compromising uh, the user's uh, security and privacy. So one thing that I'll show you is the same website, but served uh, from, a, from a hosted site. Um, the first thing that I would do is that if I hit scan here, I get a permission uh, basically uh, for me to be able to block or deny the permission to this a specific hardware API and a, a web NFC the same way you do for uh, when you grant your browser's access to like microphone uh, and for camera um, and so and even for push notifications. So after you allow that, um, you're able to use and you can see the NFC sticker here in the type in the top right, uh, left corner. If I were to tap here again, uh, I do have the permissions listed, which is great. And I can uh, remove them, I can reset them. Um, so the user has total control. Um, so when it comes to NFC, uh, there are many use cases. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, Adriana whether uh, you've used uh, NFC in any progressive WAPs or if you are aware of, of, of any of the interesting use case uh, that are available. Right, so I've not seen Adriana, but I'll just go ahead and say that um, a, a good use case other than IoT could be like uh, like a museum. If you were in a museum uh, and you can go and you can basically tap uh, close to, let's say a sculpture and that gives you more information, uh, that is actually like a really great use case like um, I believe payments and many of the things are also really important. Uh, 
All right, we have Adriana here. Um, any any examples or anything that you you have seen uh, that is like a good creative use of of NFC in general, not necessarily for web, but just in general. Oh yeah, um, so there, there's for like identification of like for using it like keys. So mm -hmm. uh, there are certain hotel uh, keys and certain elevators and all these things that are used. Uh, and then with um, as much as I like um, QR codes, and I think uh, those are very, very useful, but if you have a thing already displaying your uh, QR code, you can use an NFC tag instead and mm -hmm. it can like open your menu and in general, like any navigation that you want to do to a website or a, an app, um, you can do it that way. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I, I found incredible about NFC technology is that um, it, it, it doesn't like, it, it, it uses like magnetic induction. So uh, the way you activate the tag is by like the mobile phone itself. It basically passes the current reads and it doesn't have a battery, right? Uh, but it can last like many, many, many years. Um, so I thought that was really great. Uh, it's important to know that this is for like very like kind of like near, like close proximity, like in the range of like up to like 10 centimeters or so. Um, but it, it can definitely enable a lot of things. Uh, you can also write to tags. In this example, we have a read-only tag that is supposed to be for identification purposes, but uh, you can definitely write information to it. Um, I believe also another use case is like, let's say going, you're staying at a Airbnb and you can, uh, with, N uh, with, N with, with NFC period, you can basically tap a little sticker and that connects you to Wi-Fi. Like that is a user experience. Yeah, and, and not just um, Airbnb, like you can have it in your home too. I, I, I was gonna talk about that, yeah, when you have business <laughs> or things like that. Guests, yes. Um, all right, so since I showed that demo, I wanna show a little bit of code. Let's just, you know, uh, get into how it actually happened and, and how that, that is handled. So I, I do have the, you know, the same, um, the same app that I run here, I do have it locally. One very important thing to note is that uh, I'm serving it locally via HTTPS because it's a requirement. So it requires a user gesture, it requires HTTPS for uh, privacy and security. Um, and for this example, um, the button that I press, like scan, it just calls this function called on scan NFC. And I'm gonna zoom in so you can really see the code. Um, and the first thing we do is to see for compatibility, see if it is supported, right? Uh, we never, we can never assume what browsers is, is our applications is running on. Uh, for example, this this uh, API uh, is supported in um, Chrome and Edge because it's based on Chromium. Uh, actually, this this might be like a, a really good time to just um, uh, pull basically. Uh, can I use? and look for um, web NFC. As of right now, it's only supported for Chrome for Android, um, which makes sense, right? Like laptops as of, as of right now, as far as I know, they do not come with an NFC reader. Uh, this is more something that you will find in mobile devices, uh, but it would be great if that could come to more, uh, even mobile browsers like iOS, that would be pretty amazing. So if we check that the NF, uh, the end of reader is present, that's how we can get access uh, to NFC. And NDEF stands for NFC uh, data, data exchange format. Uh, and that's basically the standard that you use to, to read and write. Um, but going down here, uh, after we instantiate a new uh, NDF, uh, end of reader, we can call scan, which is a promise. Um, and then we can basically uh, start calling our on reading error functions and our on reading uh, functions. So the the example that I have here, um, just when this function, uh, if that this function executes whenever the scan uh, is successful, 
and it's going to have an event uh, with a message object and then uh, you can iterate, right? You get an iterable um, that, that, that you can basically iterate because it can have many different uh, records. And then we can use the text decoder API for the web and ultimately decode the data from it. And, and that was it. I do have to say, I have implemented uh, NFC uh, on like um, React Native, right? And other different other platforms, even like in Node. And the amount of code that it took to parse and decode uh, was orders of magnitude larger than the way we could do it in uh, on the web here. Great. So. Um, that was that was it. Um, I think uh, we could take a question at this point. Uh, otherwise, we could just uh, go ahead and uh, go to um, hardware uh, web Bluetooth. Oh, all right. So we have a question from Dan. Uh, it says, in many ways, PWAs and Flutter seem to have a uh, same desired outcome, supporting multiple platforms from a single code base. Why should I use uh, choose one over the other? I think you will you would love to answer this one, Adriana. I can never <laughs> see it. Yeah. I um I think it depends. Um I think uh the like the in this case the Flutter platform and um the browsers that are basically the platform that runs um PWAs, they offer different um features, different capabilities. Um, right now, as we have mentioned, we are working on a lot of features for PWAs, but the reality is they are not available everywhere. Um, and if you have an idea that requires one of those capabilities that are not available everywhere, but are available via Flutter, like I would say like, go and do Flutter. If um, your idea is better on the web, like using the capabilities that the web have, like I have said, like the flexibility, the reach, the easy to share, the uh, it doesn't have to be on a store, um, all of these things that make the web different from platform specific apps, then I would say go and use uh, a PWA. But the truth is like you are the developer that is gonna be implementing the idea. And this is one of those design decisions or a tech yes. stack decisions that you have to make based on your idea, your users and what you need and what is available right now. So it depends completely in every case. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Yeah, that was really good said. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, since we don't have that much time left, I do wanna uh, demo the, the Bluetooth, but it looks like we have a, a, another question. Is there a GitHub link uh, for the source code of the PWA Alex demo? All right, so um, I can definitely share a, a link to the source code. Um, uh, for for uh, for the code base that I've been demoing, uh, yeah, for, for sure. I'll probably post it on Twitter later, uh, and we'll do it through this channel as well. So, another web API that I'm super excited about is with Bluetooth. Um, and in this example, and I'll pull the app here. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do here is is show that the uh, the 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 web Bluetooth is supported in many more browsers than NFC. Um, you can see that it's supporting Chrome, you know, not just for Android, but also for, you know, um, any Chrome and any operating system, Edge, um, even in Opera, which I did not know, which is awesome. Um, okay, so for web Bluetooth, um, I'll go ahead and show you basically from uh, the, the two, uh, like from both web and mobile, but I'll start with mobile. So I'm gonna go ahead and I have my, my actually the same hardware that I'm going to be interacting is the Crown. This does uh, support Bluetooth and it advertises Bluetooth here uh, directly from the OS. So if I were to go ahead here, 
uh, and I tap on discover Bluetooth devices, uh, what you get is a native uh, chooser of devices that match the basically the criteria that, that you have set uh, in, at your code base level. Uh, it did find the crown device. If I go here and I tap it and the pair, um, it connects to the peripheral. Uh, it basically starts reading from characteristics. Uh, well, chooses a service, reads from characteristics, and ultimately it does give me the device ID for also uh, discovery purposes. You could see how we could take this even further from just identifying the device to even like um, receive data from the device. Uh, from like the brain, what the device has to offer. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the code base here, which you see um, that is slightly different than NFC, of course, because it's a different API. But one of the important things to note is that when you design a peripheral or a Bluetooth spec, right? Let's just call it the Bluetooth backend, um, you would specify your service your UIDs. You would specify your characteristic UIDs. Services, characteristics, descriptions are basically a way of um, formatting or like architecting what your device is capable of and can advertise whether it has uh, capabilities to like read or write or, um, or stream. So we do check if there's Bluetooth present in the navigator object of, of the browser context and we can do basically a request device. Like NFC, it does require user gesture and HTTPS. So that's good, important to know. And the user gesture is basically a button that you click. You cannot just connect to devices and you know you have to open the, the device picker and then you have to do the user gesture to get started. And then it goes through basically the flow of connecting to the GET uh, with this, the general profile attribute profile, um, part of the Bluetooth spec, and then it gets the services based on those uh, services to join this. Um, ultimately, you find the characteristic, and it does use the text encoder as well, and it can read value from a characteristic that you already know that has certain capabilities. In this case, it gives you the identifier of the device. Um, and that's basically it. Um, that is uh, a good example of how you can do device discovery right from the web browser. You can do it from your phone, you can do it for uh, from your computer as well. Um, and Adriana, uh, I'd love to, um, to ask you, um, have you experienced uh, anything with web Bluetooth, any uh, PWAs that you know that have leveraged it really well, or is it something that is more like still growing, you know, the support is also growing, so maybe not uh, being fully utilized yet? Uh, I have not had uh, any personal experience, but as you said, like my, my team is working with uh, people that need this and developers and partners that want to use it. Actually, uh, now that I have seen your demos, I kind of want to make the experiment of, of having uh, NFC tags on the different devices that I use my Bluetooth headphones to and like just mm -hmm. scanning the NF NFC so that it connects to the device that I'm using at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that would make life easier, wouldn't it? Um, there are uh, a few things uh, since we're almost at time uh, that I want to share. I think they're like good, important mentions about other different like hardware APIs. Um, can you believe that there's like an API for like serial and, and USB? There's like web USB. Yes. And um, I, well, I was gonna talk about the, the the serial one. Like we had this really cool use case in uh, Latin America of a company that had to have these platform specific apps because they couldn't interact from their web app with uh, some printers that they have because they are like, they deliver things and like they needed these very specific printers. And with the web serial API, like they unlocked this use case and like we were super happy to make developers like able to do these experiences. With these new tools, you get so much innovation happening. Uh, this is an example of Charlie Gerard. Uh, she took a basically uh, an armband that you have here. I don't think you can see here from, from, from the demo, but she's wearing a, uh, an, an armband that reads your uh, muscle data, uh, EMG. 
uh, and is able to detect like poses and gives you like eyeing your data and all the stuff. She created an amazing, um, basically, a repo that connects to this arm via web Bluetooth and is able uh, to start like detecting like gestures without using the keyboard, without using the mouse, just complete like muscle uh, data based. Uh, and that was, I thought that was really awesome. Um, there are, there is like a list of here created by Irish, uh, Irish Arquette, where a lot of different like web Bluetooth, you know, examples. Actually, one of these one is mine. Um, like this was like a, a jam stick, like a little MIDI guitar that we could connect via web Bluetooth here. Um, and then in closing, I do want to show uh, some examples that are just like for inspiration that are not necessarily uh, web uh, Bluetooth necessarily, but are uh, related and things that can happen uh, uh, for people who are interested in knowing what can you do. Um, so this one uses the device that I showed and it does uh, like control a drone with it, right? And that happens through, through Bluetooth. Um, and in this example, not web, but node. The reason why I mentioned node is because in my opinion, uh, web Bluetooth API was so well designed that someone basically ported it to node and I, I, and I got to use it. So that was really awesome. Um, other things include, uh, would you know more Bluetooth is like communicating with tiny robots or just robots, period, uh, which is really, really great. Uh, I think there's a, a huge JavaScript ecosystem, uh, not only for web Bluetooth, but also like Bluetooth running a node uh, using the web Bluetooth API like design. Um, this is the example of the sphere code, like the little sphere that uh, that video you know was controlling. So you can see like how simple it can be. And lastly, I just want to show uh, a non-web Bluetooth example, uh, but a web AR example, uh, which goes into the hardware uh, part because of the user your camera on the web and the new WebXR APIs that are also available and growing in adoption. Uh, and in this example, the same brain reading device was making the trees grow like the more in focus uh, or the, most, the more relaxed you are. <laughs> and at the end of the day, this is basically, we have a physical world, we have a digital world, the web would be like the entry point of that. And of course, these things will converge. And of course, there are many opportunities to start bringing everything together and, and having the, the, the capabilities of doing it securely just like one URL away. So um, I think I want to do it, uh, leave this here. I want to just really thank Adriana for joining me today. Uh, Adriana, it's been a pleasure. It's been awesome. You're awesome. I hope we get to do this some of the time. Um, and... Yeah, thank you so much. Same, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Um, I just want to say that uh, all these different developer teams that uh, develop platforms like the web are listening to their users. And I know in particular in Chrome, like we do check the box, we do hear uh, developer feedback, and um, we have this site for the PWA capabilities that is fugu trackerweb.app and there you can find links to the box for each um, API, the spec for each API. Uh, and I will also, uh, we'll add later the links for different uh, platforms where they receive bugs. So check that out um, later. Thank you so much. And that's Thank you. Until next. All righty. Thank you so much once again, uh, Alex and then uh, Adriana for joining us today. And then, yeah, it was fun. I was on the backstage just watching you, but it was so much fun. Thanks again. And then I will just wrap up, you know, the episode. Uh, but take care, <laughs> both of you. Thank, Thank you. Kira. Bye. Bye. All righty. Um, so. 
Thank you, everyone, for joining Between the Brackets today. Hope you all enjoyed the episode. Uh, we would like to kindly request from all of you to fill out the feedback survey in the follow-up email or link on the chat and also on the screen uh, so we can improve the show along the way. So you can use our hashtag, hashtag Between the Brackets, to share how this show was for you. And we are going to have our next episode next month. So we will be giving you more information if you sign up on the website already and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. So if you have any questions, please email us at btb team at google.com. And then we are looking forward to seeing you next month. So till then, take care. Bye-bye.